So let's start. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's roundtable discussion at the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. This event is co-hosted by Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. I'm Indu Saxena, Deputy Director of the Consortium. We at CIP are very pleased to host this event focusing on counter-terrorism strategy and tactics, lessons learned from Afghanistan. For today's discussion, we have a team of experts on terrorism and counter-terrorism study. Our esteemed speakers are Lieutenant Colonel Michael P. Cruiser, Dr. Professor Colin P. Clark, Mr. Joshua T. Froth, Mr. Andrew Mines, Mr. Anand Mishra, and Dr. Ernest Gunasekra Rockwell. Before diving into the substance, I would like to invite Director of the Consortium, Dr. Ernest Rockwell, for his opening remarks. Doc, over to you. Thanks, Indu. I uh, just want to uh, reiterate the thanks to all of the panelists for being here and for the, the few folks that we've got out in the, the audience today. Uh, I know it's uh, kind of hard to dust off the, the uh, sleepiness from the, the long break from the holiday and whatnot. Uh, and also for, for uh, our folks overseas to, to join us at, uh, at a late hour. Uh, so I'm very much appreciative of you, you being here. And I know that this is going to be a very interesting panel. Uh, we've been covering a lot on Afghanistan uh, before and after the fall of the of, uh, of, of Afghanistan to the Taliban. Uh, and I, I think it's going to be a recurring uh, a theme that we're, we're going to have to come back and revisit uh, with great regularity. In fact, we're working on a special issue right now on the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs on uh, wither Afghanistan. So, you know, we, we've all talked about what happened with the fall, what comes next. Um, that'll hopefully be out in January. Uh, that's probably going to be the first issue that we put out in the new year uh, for the journal. But as far as the consortium goes, uh, you know, we're an all-volunteer group. We started up in February of this year, uh, just started out as a handful of folks. In fact, it, I never really intended for it to be a think tank. Uh, it was just going to be a few folks that uh, were like-minded and wanted to help with the journal, but we had such an outpouring of interest and so, such qualified individuals like Indu who put in for it that uh, I thought it would be a waste of time to just have them simply be volunteers without any kind of structure to it. And so we stood up the think tank. It remains an all-volunteer force. Uh, it's a nonprofit, although we haven't got official status for it. We have no money and we don't generate any revenue. So we're, I guess we're still a, a, a nonprofit and we'll probably stay that way. Uh, so we're affiliated with the, the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs, but not part of the journal. Uh, and it gives us a little bit of leeway in what we can do, uh, but it, it does uh, also provide us with uh, the resources of, of an, a key ally in getting published and providing uh, forums like this and uh, uh, the networking necessary to make this a, su a successful operation. Uh, the, the thing that the consortium has done for the journal really is, is it's been a full multiplier in that uh, you know, we were originally just a, a quarterly publication that was putting out 96 pages every quarter. Uh, now we're, we're, we're producing stuff nonstop, uh, round the clock, pretty much uh, publishing stuff as it comes in, in, in frequent cases. Mr. Fruth's uh, uh, paper uh, uh, on the uh, Afghanistan uh, being a, a prime example of that. Um, and then, of course, we, we put out a lot of uh, special issues this year. In fact, we're, we put out eight issues already this year, and we've got the, the winter issue still to go. And we may squeeze in another special issue before the end of the, the calendar year as well. And so we've more than doubled our output just in terms of the, the number of uh, issues that we put out uh, through the, the, the hard work of the consortium. So it's, it's been a, a, a big help for us. But uh, you're not here to hear about the consortium, you're here to hear from our subject matter experts. And so without further ado, I will hand things over to Indu, and I'll be back at the end. In the meantime, I'll just be making sure everybody stays muted that needs to stay muted, and those that don't, uh, that are supposed to be speaking, stay unmuted. So thank you again, and back to you, Indu. Thanks, Doc. Uh, so moving ahead, first thing first, let me read the disclaimer here. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this discussion are those of the participant and should not be construed as carrying the official sanction of the Department of Defense, Air Force, Air Education, Training Command, Air University, or other agencies or departments of the US government or their international equivalents. Uh, moving ahead, first, please allow me to introduce today's distinguished speaker, 
I'm just uh, giving here the brief introduction as it will take me the whole day to tell about our experts and their expertise. Uh, we have a uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Cruiser with us. Lieutenant Colonel Cruiser is Deputy Chairman of the Department of International Security and Assistant Professor and Assistant Professor of International Security Studies at Air Command and Staff College. He is a career intelligence officer who has served multiple combat deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan, where he served as the Director of Intelligence and Security for the Kapisa Provincial Reconstruction Team. We have Professor Colin P. Clark with us. Professor Clark is the Director of Policy and Research at the Sufen Group. Prior to joining the Sufin Group, Dr. Clark was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and a senior political scientist at the Rand Corporation. He is also an associate fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism, The Hague, a non-resident senior fellow in the Program of National Security at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and associate fellow at the Global Network on Extremism and Technology and a member of the Network of Experts at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. His research focuses on domestic and transnational terrorism, international security, and geopolitics. We have Mr. Joshua Froth with us. Mr. Froth is the Chief Strategy Officer at Section 2 Financial Intelligence Solutions. He is an expert in anti-money laundering and counter-threat finance. He has a varied and rich experience as a U.S. Army officer, law enforcement officer, federal task force embed federal contractor, and anti-money laundering compliance director. He recently testified before the House Financial Service Committee for his co-authored white paper on Afghanistan. We have Mr. Andrew Mines. Mr. Mines is a research fellow at the Program on Extremism at George Washington University. He is the audio editor of the podcast Mosul and the Islamic State and an investigator with the National Counterterrorism Innovation Technology and Education Center, NCITE, and a contributor to the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. He also researches the Islamic State Khorasan province in the Afghanistan Pakistan region and is co-authoring a book published in 2022. We have Mr. Anand Mishra. Mr. Mishra is a research of is a researcher of military strategy and tactics at the Center for Land Warfare Studies, New Delhi, where his research is focused on military strategy and tactics. He is also a visiting research fellow at the Terrorism and Security Directorate of the International Center for Policing and Security, University of South Wales, Pontypridd. Uh, we have consortium director, Dr. Gunasekra Rockwell. Dr. Rockwell, he is a cross-disciplinarian scholar, editor, writer, researcher, and administrator with a multivalent background in publishing, social science, languages, writing, editing, teaching, and the military. So let me brief uh, about the format of this uh, today's discussion. Uh, we have uh, eight to 10 minutes for our speakers to um, give or present a brief overview of their topics and then followed by the question and answer session. So without further ado, I would like to invite Lieutenant Colonel Michael Tuzer for uh, his insight on the topic. Lieutenant Colonel Kruzer. Okay, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, uh, it's an honor to be here, especially with the esteemed panel we have. So um, as stated in the introduction, um, my experience has mainly been at the operational level uh, with respect to uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance in uh, Afghanistan, as well as a period of about a year on the ground in Kapisa province, Afghanistan, working on provincial reconstruction. So I am in position to speak uh, on both of those topics at length, and I will defer a lot of discussion, especially on current strategy with respect to the Khorasan group and uh, future relations with the Taliban government to some of the other panelists. Um, from my immediate perspectives, uh, looking at uh, some of the initial discussions we had before this panel 
and the questions posed. I'd like to first uh, look at some of the challenges moving forward from an air perspective, uh, looking at over the horizon uh, issues with counterterrorism operations. So with respect to airborne ISR and aerial targeting, there is a number of issues that can be discussed. Uh, first off, the issue with, um, it's become into focus recently with uh, personality strikes versus signature strikes for one thing. This is an issue that really dates to the early Obama administration and largely uh, fell out of vogue as a point of a lot of conversations over the last decade as we focus more on what we call signature strikes. Now, the difference between these two types of operations, as far as the academic definitions at least go, because operationally it's a little bit more complicated, but from an academic perspective, a personality strike is what we often talk about and we hear about when we have a specific individual that we are targeting who is generally a high level operative, either with political or military significance or information significance in an organization. And so this person might be observed and tracked for uh, at least weeks, but often months, a large, uh, target package will be developed on the individual and we will uh, gradually basically uh, move in on our information to get to a strike position. This goes through the targeting process, which we refer to as find, fix, finish, or find, fix, track, target, engage, assess. To do this, we've normally started with either human intelligence or signal, signals intelligence to get general information on who the potential target would be and then use a vast intelligence network to zoom in on where that target is and what their movements are. And then what the average person sees from a strike perspective, the video and the discussion of a strike uh, by a Reaper or other aircraft with a precision guide munition, that comes after this process of weeks to months of building information on the target. And so, as we now move out of Afghanistan and we talk about the prospect of over the horizon counterterrorism, our biggest challenge is a lot of those networks that we developed over many years. Some of them are probably being maintained. I can't speak, uh, even if I knew I couldn't speak to it here, obviously, but I can't speak to what we have on the ground. But without the uh, Afghan National Security Forces, without a US presence, and without any number of other potential sources of gathering intelligence, our ability to launch these types of signature strikes will likely be reduced in, or excuse me, personality strikes will be reduced in the future. Uh, from a human rights perspective, this is potentially hazardous because this might lead us to focus more on signature strikes. Now, the uh, strike that we saw outside of Bagram Air Base in the days before the final US withdrawal would be at least from what I've seen publicly about it is an example more like what a signature strike would involve. This is where we have general intelligence and a specific credible threat or where we have visibility of signatures of military operations. These are strikes that have been more acceptable when in a combat zone, when people are under fire or when other situations like this exist where we can look for signatures of military activity and we can judge the viability of a strike based on uh, probable cause based on what we're seeing. This is where the term signatures come from. We look for specific signatures that we go after. I don't see in the near future the, our um, reliance on signature strikes increasing, but I think as we see the number of personality strikes decline as we see potential for human intelligence and signals intelligence declining in this region, that can be an increased problem going forward. And there might be some increased pressure both domestically and internationally, especially if terrorist organizations like ISIS-K, Al-Qaeda, or other as yet unknown organizations arise in this vacuum of, of Afghanistan, we could see some pressures for that as well. So this is the first issue of concern I have uh, going forward. Uh, the second area, moving away from Air Force targeting and uh, ISR specifically toward the overall stability situation. 
Uh, the big question that lingers over this uh, situation right now is the future status of Afghanistan. One, our ability to work with the Taliban regime and two, the regional partnerships, both uh, looking at uh, Pakistan and then Afghanistan's northern borders, one, and then two, future relations with the Quad as the United States pivots to the Indo-PACOM region and what that uh, entails. So this is a very complex situation. And I think overall, and from, from my perspective, the biggest challenge is going to be uh, first figuring out what the relationship of India-Pakistan will be going forward as, as it relates to the issue. Uh, Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan has always been about uh, securing uh, their uh, Western border and knowing that they have some uh, area to fall back to in the event uh, situation turns with uh, India. And so this is why in the 2008-2009 timeframe, we made a significant pivot in the United States toward an AFPAC strategy. I don't think as the United States, we were ever really though able to crack that nut because I think ultimately our interest in Pakistan's interests there were never gonna be fully aligned. And we unfortunately, I don't think we're ever able to find significant leverage uh, with the Pakistani government to bring them toward our interests. So to some degree, uh, I feel, again, this is just personal opinion, not knowing what's going on inside of national strategy, but both in the Trump administration and in the Biden administration, the calculation was probably made at some point that for the future of US looking at the China region, a closer alliance through the quad with India is gonna be more important than what goes on in Afghanistan. And if we can't bring Afghanistan into a uh, situation that works to our counterterrorism strategy, we're ultimately gonna to have to refocus on the India relationship and let Afghanistan go. Now that's gonna be very destabilizing obviously for Afghanistan in the short term. The immediate impact has been the Taliban has taken back over. I don't see us establishing informal relations with the Taliban anytime soon, but there are internal uh, divisions within the Taliban uh, between um, the uh, faction that led the uh, peace talks and the different factions that were fighting in Afghanistan over a period of time. So there's some potential infighting there that can be exploited. There is significant difference between the Taliban and ISIS-K. Uh, ISIS-K, unlike Al-Qaeda, is going to be looking to establish provincial control, whereas uh, Al-Qaeda, as a base of international terrorism, literally was seeking to provide uh, money, supplies, and training to a variety of international organizations. So they had very different interests and very different goals. And so those, at least for the intermediate, the next two to four years, those are a number of potential wedges that can be exploited depending on US interests, but the downside is gonna be, it doesn't lead to resolution, it will just lead to an increasing cycle of violence and probably a return to civil war in Afghanistan. So it's gonna be this dilemma of human rights on the one side and human suffering versus what might be seen as more realist American interests in the region. And so this is the fight really that I think we've been weighing back and forth for the last five to 10 years and how do we proceed forward. And I think the realists ultimately have taken over at this point in time, but we'll see in the coming years where that stands. But uh, with that, I'd be more interested to hear some of the more current uh, information from some of our other panelists. So I'll yield back to you. Thank you for inviting me for this. Thank you, Mr. Cruiser, for your insight. Yeah, you just brief about the uh, intelligence aspect and the complex geopolitics of the region and how the uh, role of Pakistan and India. Now, when the Pakistan was a U.S. ally at that time in 2001, and now we are seeing a different face of the of those uh, allies. So but we will uh, dig it out more in the questions. And now I would like to invite Professor Colin P. Clark for his insight. Professor Clark. Thanks so much. Um, can you hear me OK? Sure. Great. Um, and thanks for having me. Uh, I think you know really interesting and important topics that we're discussing um, and you know not a whole lot of concrete answers, um, but very pleased to be on this panel with other uh, practitioners and scholars, uh, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll just put out my, my bottom line up front, which is I'm extremely pessimistic about Afghanistan, uh, about the U.S. role uh, and leverage in Afghanistan. Uh, I just had a piece 
published this morning with John Schroden and War on the Rocks, where we look at some of the struggles that the Taliban is experiencing as it attempts to flip from insurgent to counterinsurgent. A uh, very long piece detailing a lot of the challenges that that lay ahead. Um, you know, in the best case scenario, if uh, if the Taliban and then the U.S. kind of separately, because I don't see the U.S. working with the Taliban ever, there may be, uh, you know, uh, a temporary uh, overlap in interests, uh, but I don't think we, you know, should be working with the Taliban in, in, in any way. Uh, even if Islamic State Khorasan is able to be weakened, we're still left with a country with an al-Qaeda threat, with a Qani network in government, um, and with the Taliban running the show. That's the best case scenario at this point. So that gives you a sense of really how, how bad things have gotten. The worst case scenario, one can only imagine. Um, you know, I think uh, the U.S. has pretty minimal leverage. Uh, the president, um, and I've been, you know, very critical of the, the president's decision going back to April when it was first announced. Asfan Yarmir and I wrote uh, for Politico, you know, some of the challenges of what we called uh, offshore counterterrorism strategy, what the administration's calling over the horizon. Um, but, you know, our, our previous speaker detailed some of those challenges uh, in, in a quite granular level. And, and I agree with, uh, with much of what was said. But the, the president said, you know, we're, we're withdrawing from Afghanistan uh, because we want to shift resources, focus, attention to great power competition. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't think we understand what great power competition is. If we're leaving Afghanistan, which is really, you know, look at the players involved there, China, Russia, Iran, India, Pakistan, Turkey, the Gulf states. If that's not great power competition, what is? So uh, I, I think we're still grappling with this transition after 20 years uh, of the global war on terrorism, understandable amount of fatigue from, from fighting uh, those types of conflicts. Uh, and, you know, the, the national security community is, wants to look at something new uh, and move on. But, you know, the, our enemies get a vote, too. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of issues with kind of where things stand now. I think we're flying blind uh, in Afghanistan with really almost no human presence. Um, and our previous speaker spoke about find, fix, finish. Well, you can't fix and finish if you can't find. So with zero human, you know, capability on the ground, um, you know, and again, 20 years of blood and treasure in Afghanistan um, and, and taking what away from that. I mean, even, you know, really no presence. So uh, I think we're going to struggle. If you look at the kind of over the horizon strikes, uh, you know, and what happened in late August, that, that just shows you that epitomizes some of the challenges that we're going to face going forward as we seek to um, identify and eliminate threats. And, and again, we can't rely on the Taliban to do that nor should we. Um, you know, there's been a number of folks that have gone up to Capitol Hill and testified over the past uh, several several weeks. And if you go back to what uh, Colin Cowell said, you know, he, he was saying, um, you know, it could be six to 12 months where we're looking at a totally different terrorism threat in Afghanistan. Uh, and you know, frankly, some people think it's sooner than that. I mean, I've had long conversations with Bruce Hoffman about this, about um, you know, nobody's talking about Al Qaeda anymore, and and that's that's a mistake. Uh, and you know, moreover, our intelligence has been so poor on so many things. I'd urge folks to go and read the the piece in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend that detailed some of the kind of deception uh, and um, you know moves that the Taliban made in the lead up to the the, the takeover of, over of Kabul. I mean, this was not something that happened by mistake. Uh, this was a very deliberate strategy pursued by uh, a highly capable enemy, frankly. And, and I think it's, it's painful to kind of look back at some of those missteps. Um, you know, I, I have to be honest, I haven't been uh, optimistic about Afghanistan for a long time, but, but certainly not to the level of now where I'm concerned uh, that the wheels are going to fall off. Um, over the horizon is complicated. You know, civilian casualties are a real issue. Uh, and I think it's going to make us a little bit, the combination of a lack of human with civilian casualties is going to make us reticent to, you know, take shots, even when we think we have them lined up. Um, trying to think what else uh, I would like to cover. Uh, again, I think, you know, the most likely scenario to me 
when I look at the situation now, I, I think 1996 to 2001, um, you know, with the Taliban in charge, really kind of uh, ruling through a brutal draconian rule and, and, you know, essentially leading Afghanistan back down the path towards civil war. That's the outcome that I, uh, that I foresee if I, you know, were going to project, but um, a lot of good work out there. And I know um, Andrew Mines is on the call and, and some of his work with Amira uh, Jadun. These are folks that have been looking at ISK before it was trendy, urge you to go and read their work. I've uh, had the pleasure to be a reviewer on some of that. And it's some of the most rigorous and, and kind of uh, thorough and comprehensive research on, on ISK. Everybody's kind of jumped into the fray now with their own take, but I urge you to go and read the, you know, the deep research uh, think about this group, its capabilities, how it's kind of uh, evolved over the years and what threat that it presents moving forward. Um, and, and I've done some work more recently with Abdul Saeed, a researcher based in Sweden, looking at the kind of role of the Haqqani network. Um, and again, I think that's another group that's really, you know, within the Taliban that is underexamined and, and misunderstood. Uh, I think we're, we're in over our head right now. Um, and again, not to be all doom and gloom, but I'm just trying to be out here calling balls and strikes. This is really the way I see things trending, uh, a downward spiral with very minimal U.S. leverage. So hopefully someone has better news than me. Uh, if so, I'd love to hear it. But thanks again for the invitation and looking forward to hearing the other speakers. Thank you, Professor Clark, for your insight. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Joshua Froth. Uh, Mr. Froth, over to you. Indu, thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. First and foremost, um, I think that I'm going to have some opinions that are not popular on Afghanistan, um, but that's okay. So just the last couple of assignments, I have been a career Army intelligence officer. Um, most recently, as of 2019, I was still in Afghanistan, and I was overseeing uh, all of NATO uh, special operations uh, counter threat finance functions for two successive uh, commanding generals of NATO special operations, Buck Yeldon and... Uh, and uh, uh, Chris Donahue, who was the last man in Afghanistan. So big picture, uh, there's a couple, oh, excuse me, as I was, I also was at the counter, uh, National Counterterrorism Center uh, after that assignment most recently. Um, so I focused on these issues for a while. I think big picture, there's a lot of misconceptions and things that are being proliferated in the information environment that I disagree with and have a problem with uh, regarding Afghanistan, but doing a quick kind of once over to the things that have happened here uh, just in the last few months, everybody knows the Taliban has taken over. Uh, we're not really talking about the fact that it's the greatest human rights violation, I think, now uh, against women and girls, uh, religious and ethnic minorities, uh, members of the LGBTQ and other um, uh, disenfranchised and vulnerable populations. All of a sudden, everybody's values went out the window all over the world, and we proclaim to care about all these populations. And all of a sudden now, we're watching the worst human rights violations happen against these people that we've ever seen. And the only other major human rights violator to that extent is China, what they are doing with three and a half million uh, Uyghur religious and ethnic minority uh, people that they're putting in concentration camps. And guess what? Now they're in bed with the Taliban. So I think that's something we ought to look at first and foremost. We also have a number of uh, of families of U.S. persons, as well as a number of our uh, special immigrant visa Afghan partners and their families uh, that are still in Afghanistan, numbering in the tens of the thousands. Um, and the number one concern that I have in a post-drawdown environment, Indu, is that that environment of all of these people that are our friends and our allies, and think about the Northern Resistance uh, Front as well in, in the Panjshir, all of these people that have been our friends for so long, if we don't take care of them, if we don't evacuate them from that country now, at some point, we could have an emerging kidnap for ransom environment where any priorities, soft power uh, policy priorities that we have in Afghanistan with our partners or what have you, we could be giving our enemies and our near state adversaries that in the great power competition that have a foothold in Afghanistan, we could be giving them some semblance of negotiating leverage by allowing that human rights uh, a, a atrocity of an environment to continue to operate the way it is and to continue to hurt our friends and allies uh, in country. So I think we really need to prioritize uh, continued 
uh, evacuation operations, humanitarian assistance operations in Afghanistan to get folks out, first and foremost. Now, second, I think we can't oversee the fact that the Taliban has emerged as the most well-funded, well-armed, well-resourced terrorist group in history. Nothing even remotely close. ISIS core was never even remotely close to what we see in the Taliban. They're also most likely uh, the world's largest drug cartel and narco-terrorist state. And I say that having been uh, working with the DEA uh, in Afghanistan as recently as 2019 and having been part of uh, a major operation to degrade and ultimately destroy the Taliban's incursion after 20 years in the heroin business into a new crystal methamphetamine business. Around 2017, the Taliban found a plant in the mountainous Dakundi and Uruzgan provinces of Afghanistan that they call the Oman Bush. It's a strain of the ephedris plant. It produces ephedra, which is the primary reagent that go in, goes into amphetamines like crystal methamphetamine uh, and MDMA or ecstasy. And within a year, the Taliban became perhaps the largest methamphetamine production infrastructure organization in the world to even rival Jalisco New Generation Cartel uh, in Mexico. And ultimately, we destroyed that capability. But the Taliban have since reconstituted that capability. So we're looking at a, a narco terror state that has consolidated power. And if this, if the whole nature of this is what lessons have we learned and what's the current sit temper situation template in Afghanistan, I would argue that we have a, a, an environment where not only the Taliban have created uh, a power structure that's unlike anything we've ever seen in a terrorist group before, but they also have provided a vacuum for other insurgent groups. And we think about the Haqqani network that were nested in Pakistan for all these years. We certainly think about Al-Qaeda, um, but we also have to think about, Al about ISIS-K. And this is something that is really frustrating to me. What I'm seeing in the media is not matching the ground truth of what I'm hearing on the ground uh, from, from my network, from the people that I'm talking to. When we deal with ISIS Khorasan, it's a very, very complicated issue that I think a lot of Westerners don't fully understand. Uh, and I think a lot of the media outlets and analysts that are talking about this are talking about uh, information that's two to three years old. Uh, in 2019, the Taliban nearly obliterated ISIS-K. They pushed them through Nangarhar province into Pakistan into the Peshawar, nearly obliterated them. And anybody that wasn't uh, destroyed was pretty much arrested. Now, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, we left Bagram Airfield in the middle of the night, and we left it to ANDSF, um, and they surrendered that airfield to the Taliban. The Taliban came in, and there were thousands of ISIS-K fighters in that prison. They killed the leader, Khorasani. They killed eight of his deputies, and then they released thousands of ISIS-K fighters. Now, I want everybody to put their common sense hat on for a second. If these two organizations were really fighting for all these years, if they were really fighting, then why would the Taliban release thousands of them and not just execute them in the prison? Why would they do that? There had to be some semblance of an agreement as to why they would agree to do that. Now, one of those fighters that they released conducted the attack on Hamid Karzai International Airport 11 days later that killed a lot of US service members and a lot of our Afghan allies and, and, and innocent civilians that were looking to escape from that country. And they did it while the Haqqani Network's Badri 313 unit was securing uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport. Now we have to remember there's a connection between ISIS-K and the Haqqani Network. Uh, and, and that extends from uh, tribal, uh, uh, ethnic, family, geographic, business, supply chain, Hawala relationships that are longstanding in the Northeast uh, and in other places. And we have to remember that ISIS core uh, in Iraq and Syria was originally a byproduct of Al-Qaeda of Iraq uh, and that Al-Qaeda has a longstanding relationship with the Taliban. So we can't oversimplify these relationships like we like to do with the West. It's not just black and white. Um, my presumption is that a lot of ISIS-K fighters are actually operating currently as proxies for the Taliban. There's an old saying in Afghanistan about turning your turban. Uh, and it's an age old reference for hundreds of years that talks about uh, essentially turning your loyalty uh, to favor the winner. There's no question right now who the winner is in Afghanistan, it's the Taliban. But we also have to remember that there's other beneficiaries other than the Taliban and the other insurgent groups that are there and it's mainly China and Pakistan. Now, the difference in, I guess you could call it the occupation, so to speak, of Pakistan and China, vice the U.S., is that those two countries have recognized the Taliban's new Islamic Emirate as the legitimate uh, regime uh, 
uh, of Afghanistan. And we have to remember that if the Taliban want to actually govern here, they face a really uphill battle and they need uh, China and Pakistan to help. I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in time the Taliban actually declare uh, some type of Islamic caliphate uh, of their, of their uh, new uh, uh, Islamic uh, emirate regime. A lot of different folks in the Middle East and the Gulf may not recognize them, but it doesn't really matter because funding will flood in, fighters from around the world will flood in, uh, and ultimately the notion of destroying a Taliban-like uh, uh, caliphate would be totally different than what we did with ISIS core in Iraq and Syria. I mean, you have to think back uh, to, to the, the global defeat ISIS campaign. You had three distinct groups that didn't necessarily get along, uh, were really enemies, but came together and collectively fought ISIS. You had the Assad regime uh, backed by uh, the Russians, and you had uh, Iran and hundreds of various Shiite militia groups, and you had the US and, and other NATO forces uh, that were supporting the Kurds. And it took that international coalition of effort to, uh, to defeat ISIS and their territorial caliphate and push their fighters to remote provinces uh, to, to change their tactics. There's no international impetus to do anything like that today in Afghanistan. There is no going back militarily to Afghanistan. There's not, that's not gonna happen with China, with Pakistan, with Iran, with Russia. I fear that in a post drawdown environment, however, that the benefits that Russia and Iran thought they were going to have in Afghanistan might not pan out the way they had originally expected. The primary benefactors here are China and Pakistan. We have to remember that there are 1.4 million metric tons of over a trillion US dollars worth of rare earth elements spread out in Afghanistan. Everything from uh, cobalt to lithium, uh, to neodymium, to dysprosium, uh, to uh, a number of other rare earth minerals that go into every component of uh, emerging technology that's going to become critically important in the decades to come. China hasn't lost sight of this, and anybody think, that thinks that, uh, that they're not going to go in and extract these minerals, that China's not going to go in and do that is crazy. Uh, there's a reason that they have recognized uh, the, the Taliban regime. There's a reason that they're in bed with Pakistan on this. And that reason is that there's no way, there's just no way that China could manage the complex uh, tribal, uh, historical, ideological, religious uh, divisions, the complicated divisions for 1500 years in Afghanistan. China can't manage that. They need Pakistan to do that on their behalf. Now, we already know that China and Pakistan are close trade partners. They have a lot in common. Uh, I see a lot of our Indian friends and allies here on the line today. One of their big uh, points of contention is that they both have a problem with India. The other issue that they have is, or excuse me, the other uh, element of their relationship is, is trade. We have the Belt and Road Initiative. We have the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor. They go through Badakhshan Province uh, and, and the Wakhan Corridor uh, in Afghanistan. And we know that China wants these rare earth minerals but Pakistan is in a dire economic state. They are FATF for Financial Action Task Force gray listed. They're under a lot of pressure to get their ducks in a row here and to, to stop funding terror. And they're also receiving quarterly disbursements from the International Monetary Fund, uh, 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 the IMF, that's keeping them above ground here uh, economically. They're in bad shape. They need to hedge their bets on China. And I think after the last 20 years, when we start to see Pakistan come out and say, we were the custodians of the Taliban for the last 20 years. We fed them, we housed them, we provided thousands of kids, uh, thousands of Mujahideen fighters from these madrasas, these radicalization schools uh, all over Pakistan to fight with the Talib, the Pashtun Talib every year. Uh, these are not our allies. Pakistan is not our friends. We've given them funding. Uh, we've given them laser guided munitions that I believe that they used on the Northern Resistance Front uh, and bombed our allies in the Northern Resistance Front in the Panjshir. So these are not our allies. But for China to extract these rare minerals, uh, that's part of their great power competition ambitions. And I agree with our other speaker here uh, that was talking about uh, the importance of Afghanistan in a post drawdown environment in the great power competition, because ultimately, 
China, we have to look at this not siloed geographically like U.S. Central Command or U.S. Indo-Pacific Command areas of responsibility. We need to expand our aperture globally and recognize that China is looking at winning the great power competition by doing two things. Number one, they want to dominate emerging technologies in the next 10 years. And number two, they want to dominate the information environment. And these two, these two various uh, lines of effort are interconnected. In order to dominate uh, the emerging technology market, China needs to be able to uh, choke off supply chains, particularly the United States and its Western allies. In order to do that, they need copious amounts of rare earths uh, because those are the underlying source materials that go into these uh, emerging technologies. And they also need to steal technology. They need to uh, uh, get beneficial ownership through complex corporate structures into these various entities. And they need to dominate the information environment. They're going to do that through China or through Afghanistan, uh, the Congo, uh, Brazil, uh, Australia, and other places where they can extract these rare minerals. And then they're going to seize Taiwan and the semiconductor and silicone um, uh, businesses in Taiwan. And if they can do those two things, they're going to dominate emerging technology. If they dominate emerging technology, while they're working that line of effort, they're going to concurrently continue to put satellites in space lines on the ocean floor and towers all over the world as part of their Belt and Road Initiative, as part of their telecommunications expansion. Uh, as they expand that telecommunications infrastructure, the 5G networks that we use in those emerging countries are going to be Chinese 5G networks. Then they're going to implement Chinese uh, uh, hardware like Huawei and ZTE. Once they control the hardware and the 5G environment, that internet of things or that uh, intersection, that, inter that interconnected technology of actual physical things to the internet that's going to control every facet of how we live in our critical infrastructure is going to be tied to these Chinese 5G networks. Once they have the hardware, then they can control the software and then they can control the data and suppress the data or put out whatever data they want. So uh, that concludes my uh, opening. I apologize if I went over. Thank you, Mr. Poth, for your detailed insight. And um, I echo with your argument, like uh, ISK uh, can be the proxy or is the proxy of the Taliban and uh, what the international community is waiting for Taliban to be socialized. So uh, I guess the US needs a solid and robust counterterrorism strategy. And that definitely it's going to hurt the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, US Indo-Pacific strategy in long term. Yeah, Indo, I'm sorry, just my closing comment would just be basically the current environment as I see it, is you have a relationship between China uh, and Pakistan and all of these various insurgent groups uh, that, that favor the winner, which is an unpopular position, but that's my position. Thank you. Now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Andrew Mines for his insight. Mr. Mines, over to you. Perfect, thank you, Indu. Is it all right if I share some slides? Would that be okay? Or... Yeah, sure. Okay, perfect, thank you. Let me just pull this up here. Do you guys see this okay? Perfect, thanks. Well, um, look, Indu, thank you for setting this up. I wanna thank the consortium for the invitation and, and for hosting this. This has been, a, this has been enlightening for me uh, to, to hear from the other speakers on this panel. Um, I'm gonna do, I apologize if this runs forward to about 15 minutes, but I'm going to spend about 15 minutes or so talking about ISK just because I think this is a threat that a lot of people um, don't have a good grasp on. And, um, you know, I definitely encourage you to look at um, Professor Clark's piece this morning. I think that really puts things into perspective. And I, I, I've been working with my mentor and my colleague and, and co-author, Dr. Amir Jadun, on this group for some years. And I think this is a group that people are just starting to wake up uh, and realize the threat that they pose. But to, to start out here, there are some key lessons from ISK's history that help us make sense of what they're doing today. And so over the last seven years of their existence, government operations to target and counter this group have spanned well over 30 provinces across Afghanistan and Pakistan. We've moved from the streets of Kabul, Jalalabad, Lahore, Karachi. I think people forget about the Pakistan component of this organization. They tend to fixate on Afghanistan, but they've had a heavy presence in Pakistan of a different nature too. So you've moved from major cities across the region 
uh, to the mountains and valleys of Northeast Afghanistan where more of their traditional strongholds have been centered and beyond. And what's happened over the last several years is that the sheer range of targeting tactics to combat this group have been expansive. We fired cruise missiles by our ships hundreds of miles away, uh, dozens if not hundreds of drone strikes and airstrikes, the one-time use of the world's largest non-nuclear bomb in 2017, the only time in history that it's been deployed, uh, complex Joint Special Forces operations, and that's all kind of on the high end. But on the low end, we're also had extensive police raids, uh, arrests of local recruiters in, in urban networks, uh, and even university professors on the low end. And so you, we've also seen the range of targeting forces involved be pretty expansive from U.S. and Afghan air intelligence and special forces assets to Afghan police forces, local police forces, and then the Pakistani counterterrorism police units and more, Afghan intelligence operations. And so the compounding effect of all of these efforts over the last you know, several years was the containment and the gradual degradation of ISK from 2015 to 2020. And so Dr. Jadun and I have cataloged well over 10,000 of its affiliated numbers. And I want that number to just kind of stick for a second because uh, it, it is an expansive number. 10,000 of its affiliated members reportedly captured killed or surrendered to government forces. And among them were hundreds of the group's leadership. And so what happened over this period was also the gradual a loss of all of ISK's territory. And as a result, the group moved a lot of their remaining personnel, low-level leadership, operational assets, uh, into major cities that weren't already there and their surroundings, particularly Kabul and Jalalabad. And so urban attacks like those we've seen over the last couple of months have been common. Uh, since the fall of the Ghani government, those kinds of attacks have been prioritized. Uh, recruitment efforts to replenish their ranks have been uh, reprioritized, and that largely plays out in the data you see on your screen, particularly to, towards the end of 2020. ISK is a much smaller organization. It's taking fewer losses because it's been moved to urban areas, uh, but the group's total attack numbers begin to rapidly increase under the new leader. Uh, this is a man with extensive experience in the Haqqani network in Al-Qaeda and other organizations. And he was appointed to revamp ISK's uh, operational strategy. And since his appointment, they've carried out some of their worst attacks to date. But their rivalry with the Taliban extends just as far back in the group's history. And so these two organizations have classed in at least 16 provinces across Afghanistan. Uh, they've left tens of thousands of civilians either dead or displaced in their wake. And this is the component of this dyad that we often oversee is just how much civilian displacement is the result of ISK and Taliban fighting. And so when ISK was officially founded in 2015, you know, we kind of forget about this, but the Taliban were actually facing a pretty critical juncture in their history. On top of hundreds of leaders and fighters who had already defected to form some of the founding components of ISK, hundreds, if not thousands more, were in the process of trading sides, or at least were deliberating about whether to trade sides. And so you know, many of these ISK leading factions were quickly stamped out by the Taliban. Uh, renegade commanders were either killed or, or offered amnesty to rejoin the organization. But I think one of the components too, again, we overlook this, is that US strikes and Afghan forces interventions delivered some tactical blows that significantly helped the Taliban crackdowns in some of these areas. But when we move past 2015, most of the fighting starts to center pretty squarely in or around those, those, or, those uh, provinces in yellow and red you see on your screen. Uh, that's Ningahar and Kunar in the or northeast and then Jazjan in the north. And this is where accounts of the ISK Taliban history really start to diverge. And I think this is, there are some harmful narratives that have emerged from that divergence. Um, you know, Taliban sources, media outlets, and even some academic sources have often inflated or mischaracterized the Taliban's role in combating ISK throughout Afghanistan. And to be sure, you know, those crackdowns in 2015 that I just mentioned, those were well managed. Uh, the Taliban organized pretty large mobilizations of fighters to counter ISK around those main uh, pockets of, of territorial control. But these largely piggybacked off of pre-existing U.S. and Afghan Air Force strikes, uh, drone strikes, but also major ground interventions. And those dealt significant blows to ISK manpower and especially their leadership. And had they been left to their own devices, it's really not clear how effective the Taliban would have been in containing ISK. But I think it's a fair assessment to say that even an optimistic outlook would probably be much worse than what we saw from 2015 to 2020, especially in terms of the impact on civilians. And so I think that's, a, that's an, a component of this rivalry and the history of this rivalry that we need to bear in mind.
But today, these organizations, um, they're not competing in any real meaningful sense for territorial control just yet. We've actually seen ISK in its own propaganda and its own kind of clerical establishment reflect on the group's strategy and have come to the conclusion that this is not the time for territorial consolidation for Tenkin. What we're seeing instead is the gradual implementation of an insurgency method that actually draws pretty heavily on ISIS's method in the lead up to 2014. And so you can see on your screens that overall ISK attacks have increased tremendously this year, but the nature of these attacks has changed a bit too. So we're still seeing some of those highly lethal devastating attacks of previous years. These have targeted vulnerable minorities like the Hazaras, but we're also seeing more low grade non-lethal attacks that ISK labels as economic warfare. Other affiliates of the Islamic State movement do this too. Uh, these are meant to starve urban areas of power and resupply. And so uh, one of these attacks that actually left Kabul you know, temporarily in darkness a few, uh, a few weeks back or several weeks back at this point. And the broader purpose of these attacks is meant to undercut the Taliban's legit their legitimacy and efforts to govern, uh, their kind of legitimacy as a governing institution. But they can also confuse and instill fear in the population too. And that's a very important component. We're also seeing dozens of smaller attacks as part of that insurgency method within ISK's former stronghold of Ningahar province, particularly around Jalalabad. And these attacks have targeted just about everyone. Uh, we've seen them target Taliban officials and fighters, members of the former government, journalists, uh, civil society activists, community elders, and voices who have spoken out against ISK within the local Salafi community in particular. And each attack is only leaving you know, a handful dead or wounded on average. And this isn't you know, to discredit or to kind of diminish or discount those lives. That's not at all what I want to say, but you can see that the data on your screen reflect a very different attack strategy with lower average casualty counts per ISK attack. But the cumulative effect of this high volume of attacks does a few things that are slightly different from you know, fewer but more highly lethal attacks. And the first thing is that these smaller targeted attacks have drawn reprisals from the Taliban against local communities particularly Salafi communities that the Taliban has historically marginalized, uh, that they distrust, and they continue to do so today, although there has been some kind of um, you know, politicking behind the scenes between the Taliban and elders of the, of the community. But this is pretty much what ISK wants. They want to isolate these communities from the Taliban uh, to draw in recruits. Uh, they want to extort and gain uh, compliance from those who are not willing to join the fight. And they've assassinated moderate voices within those communities too that they deem, uh, you know, they deem this community to be a strategic recruitment pool. And so they are carving away that middle ground for the community and in other communities uh, to really you know, isolate the population from the Taliban. And the second thing that these attacks do is they also spread Taliban resources pretty thin. So on top of trying to protect soft targets like places of worship uh, against highly lethal mass casualty attacks, Taliban now also now have to protect a much wider range of potential targets. They have spread security assets out a lot thinner. Uh, they have increased the number and frequency of security patrols. But then what happens is that these units become easier targets themselves. And this is a pretty classic feature of insurgency and counterinsurgency that we saw the Islamic State use in Iraq and which its affiliate in Afghanistan is now using. And then the third thing is that this high volume of virtually daily attacks, you know, not just on civilian targets, but on Taliban targets as well, this presents the image that ISK are more numerous than they are, uh, that they're more influential than they are, and that they're more powerful than they are. And so you pull all of those three things together and we see ISK injecting divisions between the population and the Taliban, spreading Taliban resources thin and chipping away at them, and then projecting the image of a powerful insurgent force. But while this is all happening, we also see ISK in the background. They're examining the landscape to see which of the other militant groups in the region they can continue to leverage their alliances with, or they can perhaps you know, begin to leverage new alliances with. And there's also some evidence, and I think it's difficult to verify this. Um, and so if any of the other panelists have more insights, I'd, be, I'd welcome those. But uh, there has been some evidence that ISK has tried to at least attempt to infiltrate Taliban uh, governing systems for leverage down the line. And at the same time, uh, my colleague Abdul Syed has written extensively about this. The anti-Taliban narratives and ISK propaganda and messaging campaigns have ramped up significantly. And they're really hammering home this perception of the Taliban as a puppet regime of Western and regional governments and as traitors to groups and communities that ISK is trying to win over, as well as traitors to the jihadist movement in general. 
And so I think when we when we take a step back here, it, it's it's useful to situate this past year's developments back into context and to think about ISK's traditional sources of resilience. This is a group that has long sought out strategic alliances with other militant groups, whether ideological, logistical, or operational in nature. Uh, and these, off, these alliances have offered ISK new sources of recruitment, uh, operational enhancements, protection, but most importantly, perhaps longevity. And then on the flip side, they've strategically selected the Taliban as their main rival in a bid to outcompete them, to delegitimize their claim to the jihadist movement, and to try and establish ISK as the preeminent jihadist force in the broader region. And these are factors that are unlikely to change. ISK have also recruited prolifically across the region. You know, within Afghanistan, I think there's a tendency to focus on their ability to recruit in the Northeast, uh, in Salafis in the Northeast, but they've recruited young Afghans, Afghans in urban areas, uh, marginalized ethnic Tajiks and Uzbeks in the past, uh, and other groups that they're starting to tap into more. They've also benefited from regional and international recruits from uh, Pakistan in particular, you know, thousands of their, their recruits have come from across the border, but also from well over a dozen nations we found. And this isn't anything kind of comparable to what ISIS did in 2013 to 2015, you know, 16, a little bit less so, but it's still pretty substantial. We've cataloged recruits coming from France all the way to Southeast Asia and other countries in between. And there's one or two actually attempted American travelers in there too. And some of these recruits have actually featured pretty heavily in recent ISK propaganda the last year or so. Uh, last year, that included an Indian foreign fighter who attacked a Sikh temple. Uh, this year, of course, the Uyghur fighter who carried out the, uh, the attack in Kunduz in retaliation for what ISK claimed was uh, you know, the Taliban expelling Uyghur Muslims to appease China. And so if we look at, you know, on the other hand, if we look at key financial pillars, they've benefited by tapping into transnational smuggling economies like timber and minerals in the past, but there's also extensive evidence that ISK have been heavily bankrolled by the core movement leadership in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, Antonio Gestazzi, who's, who's written a book on the group, had sort of more of the high-end estimates that are, again, based on, those are based on uh, you know, interview evidence, and so they're hard to verify, but those ran into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they've also received more than just financial assistance from ISIS core leadership. We have a lot of evidence from captured material and other documentation that ISIS has sent trainers and advisors to assist ISK. Uh, they sent a delegation to replace failing ISK leadership back in 2019. They've offered counsel and support for managing internal dissent and providing a bit of organizational learning that you know, the group has had to work with for well over a decade now. And so when you package all of this together on top of the dynamics that I spoke about in the previous slides, I think this speaks to a comprehensive method of insurgency that is modeled on the Islamic State in Iraq and then ISIS, of course, but it has adapted to fit regional dynamics and needs. And so um, as Dr. Clark argued in his piece this morning, and as uh, Dr. Jadud and I have argued, it is unlikely that the Taliban will be able to grapple with ISK on top of the other challenges that they face today. And so I'll turn it back to you, and do Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Andrew, for your interesting presentation. Now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Mishra for his views. Mr. Mishra. Uh, thank you, Vindu. Uh, thank you. Am I audible to you? Yes. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Uh, well, there's no one more happy uh, than me to, to hear the comments uh, from Pakistan uh, uh, being bashed here in that forum. Bashing is a good, good word and an appropriate in an academic forum. If it was, then uh, it would uh, probably be the right word that I would use here. Uh, well, we haven't been saying this uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, two years or three years. We've been saying this since 2008, probably before that. We have been saying this since 2611. We recently completed 13 years uh, of the anniversary of 2611. We have been saying this over and over again. So, but from the, again, going into a military strategic perspective, uh, we in India were skeptical uh, when, uh, uh, the talk about uh, uh, ISAF uh, came into the picture in 2003. Uh, the institutionali institutionalization, uh, uh, a dedicated setup uh, to micromanage uh, military efforts in Afghanistan with its previous history. Uh, we were skeptical since then. Uh, we were, uh, we did an extensive analysis of uh, ISAF as an institution. How will it will, uh, you know, convert its progress uh, on the ground? 
uh, how the reactions will be. Uh, my comments will uh, will definitely be called as radical, and I'm pretty sure Joshua served there, uh, and most of you served there in the part of the ISAF, and they will not be happy. Uh, I will take 15 minutes, uh, which is a set time, and uh, I'm sharing the presentation. Uh, can you see everybody? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, I'll first begin about the institutional analysis, what ISAF is. And we've. Uh, I'll just quickly run down of what ISAF is and the importance of ISAF, which we thought as a credible institution. Uh, and we were skeptical a little later. So, uh, 2003 established a UN mandate, NATO-led international force. Uh, U.S. was its major uh, troop contributor, 18,000 in the East region. Uh, 2011 estimate, it reached down to 98,000 troops. Uh, again, when I spoke to uh, my counterparts uh, in Britain, in Australia, uh, when I told him uh, about, when I asked about the efforts, uh, the retreat uh, from Afghanistan, they said, oh, no, it's a U.S.-led mission. We didn't do anything about it. It was not our role. It was a U.S.-led mission. Over and over and over again, they would reiterate it was a U.S.-led mission. So it makes us think whether there was the decision making rested with the U.S. leadership only. Interaction with regional allies were either based on U.S. decision makers' expectations. So that was again a skeptics for us. So this is basically 71,030 uh, troops by 2009. Uh, this was uh, I'm, I'm very I'm very much sure uh, you most of you have served there. Uh, again, uh, at the PRT. Uh, and the regional command, the U.S. was at its lead. You can count from Kunar, Nuristan, Panjshir, uh, uh, Nangahar, Logar, Paktia. The U.S. was at a dominant player. Uh, again, so the ISAF, the mandate to protect uh, the Afghan people, neutralize insurgent networks. Primary objective in Afghanistan was to enable Afghan authorities. Effective security mechanism was its key. Civil military stabilization and fulfill counterinsurgency tasks was one which ISAF was tasked to do. But again, whether it is counterinsurgency or counterterrorism, we were not sure what the ISAF mandate talked about. Uh, the ISAF did uh, uh, talk about stability in the region. So was it a cow coin operation? Because uh, peacekeeping missions do not do well, do not dwell well with coin uh, and stability operations. So was did ISAF coin, coin the coin way? Uh, we were not sure. Uh, so did the mandate empower ISF to uh, what, annihilate Al-Qaeda and Taliban? Was it there or conduct counterinsurgency operations? Again, this was unclear. Hearts and minds, uh, will ISAF win it? Will it not? What was the objective? The objective achieved? Uh, again, that was a bit of an unsurety. So India has been uh, leading counterinsurgency operations for more than decades. So in, in Jammu Kashmir and in Northeast, this was a lesson that we personally learned. Uh, during Operation Green Hunt in 2010, where the objective was to and highlight uh, uh, and, and and limit the uh, operational capability of uh, paramilitary, uh, you know, uh, Naxal uh, groups uh, in Chhattisgarh, uh, in in particular. But then it backfired in a way that once the operation came to a close, 75 CRPF troops were ambushed and killed uh, post operation. So this was a hard lesson that we learned uh, from from our own uh, counterinsurgency operations. But again, uh, when we talk about counterinsurgency, was it counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, unsure of, of what it was because the mandate did not made it evidently clear. Uh, the counterterrorism operations conducted by the US was in a definition was a limited operation because again, uh, for uh, conducting uh, counterterror ops, uh, uh, the UAV, uh, the drones and the predators had a very limited range. Uh, uh, Al-Qaeda operations, uh, you know, uh, were, relunk, were, were passively carried out uh, from, from Afghanistan, but then and actively carried out from Pakistan. So uh, we were unsure as to what the SF teams either could have been launched from a certain distance, uh, CSR would have been acquired. Uh, this means that, uh, you know, the, the capability could have uh, probably uh, been operational at night, but then without AH-64, it would have been not been possible. So, uh, uh, the only possible solution could use could be to use precision guided munitions, which Washington took into its account. But uh, again, uh, in case of HVTs, the ISI was involved in Pakistan. They were pretty active in 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 and around uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. Uh, we had uh, SF personnel for tagging 
uh, bagging and tagging that we call in SF terminology was critical. So the counter terror operations in our in our understanding was limited. CT operations required SF presence again, uh, but during that time, ISAF and Washington uh, were reluctant because a lot of collateral uh, for the civilian losses had occurred. So violation of Pakistani sovereignty was again a question. Uh, so did the CT uh, counter terror operations were successful? Uh, uh, it is it is a bit hard to say. But uh, then Washington treated carefully, which resulted in limited CT operations. Now, challenges uh, for intel collection for CT ops, again, it was difficult for US to identify targets. Again, uh, would have uh, would preferably would have come in, uh, into reliance on CIA and identify and isolate HVTs. In case of OBL, it was known, it is still known that Al-Qaeda and Taliban were very active in hiding sig uh, signatures. Um, so uh, it was left for the CIA to do a thorough back channeling. ISI again was involved in this. The reports were accessed. ISI deliberately falsified those documents to hide uh, true identities. Uh, but the ISAF allies uh, were able to identify the HVTs known the Guar, but their location and target acquisition was again a matter of uh, you know uh, difficulty. Pakistan again is not an easy partner. We have been saying this for over and over again since 2008. And since 2008, we have been saying it multiple times, whether you talk about UN Security Council resolutions, whether you talk about our, our permanent representative uh, speaking in UN. Um, so, well, for the for ISAF and uh, allies, uh, SF took more hours to deploy and predators were uh, available uh, depending upon its uh, resource capability. The HVTs went off uh, 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 probably went underground, hiding in plain sight. So again, intelligence was uh, was pro probably one of the main reasons why uh, Washington was reluctant uh, to conduct an effective CT ops. Uh, now, what if the HVTs were for for scenarios where HVTs were uh, hiding in Pakistan? Now again, uh, uh, Quetta was a preferred location for UAVs uh, to to use the tarmac, uh, but then uh, uh, one of the uh, news outlets released the exact location of the UAV base uh, and uh, Washington was forced to, to use Jalalabad instead of Quetta. Uh, we've been saying this, uh, well, Pakistan has been an effective, effective partner with Taliban and they've been training. You've got another segment of Taliban coming in. Uh, I was a little amazed nobody uh, mentioned, no, none of the speakers mentioned tehreek -e taliban uh, another segment of, of you know, uh, which, which, uh, which uh, is more treated than Taliban. They are more radicalized than Taliban. So, uh, Tariqe Taliban again came into the picture, but UAVs uh, using um, on uh, using UAVs from Pakistan would definitely would violate sovereignty. So, uh, UAV uh, strategy was effective, but Islamabad was repetitive, was repetitively reluctant to support counterterrorism initiatives, which again were reiterated through us. The ISI expressed discomfort. Uh, the ISI was was uh, and again the presence of DGISI. The director general of ISI in Pakistan, uh, from uh, tr to traveling all the way to Afghanistan uh, during the Panjshiri offense, uh, again raised eyebrows. So we've been monitoring those situations, but um, you know, they were I don't know uh, why was the, was it not covered by much scholars? Uh, HVTs crossing from Pakistan to Afghanistan, ISI felt a lot of discomfort uh, when Washington sought uh, named Noam de Guar and uh, possible locations. Now. For more continuation of CT ops, uh, it was uh, it was a constant deployment of troops was a must. Uh, dedicated CT orientation uh, could basically legally force US to get into uh, a formalized treaty of forces and put a temporary stop to coin operations, particularly in the region. So coin was much more easy uh, for Washington to conduct rather than uh, counter terror operations. You've got uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1267, 1333 coming up. Uh, but again, limiting uh, to to uh, uh, freeze uh, the assets of uh, you know uh, Al Qaeda, Taliban, as well as Haqqani network was something that a paper can do. Uh, you cannot rely on a piece of a paper, it, albeit it is UN. So unsure as to what the Afghans demand in return again was something that we thought was an app. We were apprehensive. Uh, Washington was um, you know uh, a bit uh, uh, the the stance would do. What will stance do? In this particular scenario, where restrictions uh, will be imposed, uh, will there be negotiations? So again, uh, CT options was much limited as compared to Coin. US continued to uh, to to support Coin operation through ISF uh, and allies. 
and relegated its policy to CT2 limited ops, uh, particularly in counter-terror operations, which is again, uh, something that we were monitoring. Uh, now, coin ops are easy to, to maneuver because it has a mandate which, which has specific rules of engagement. Commanders from the higher echelon relay exact objectives to tactical commanders on the ground. Unification of services, all the tri services, whether it is the Marine Corps component coming in, the fourth component, uh, is their roles are abundantly clear. Intelligence operations are from bottom to top. Uh, possibly, possible identification of HVTs are, are isolated. Uh, the commitments are not based on timelines. Again, something that we were not uh, very, uh, very comfortable when Washington uh, released um, an official note of uh, withdrawing uh, uh, from, from Afghanistan. There are no timelines. I mean, you cannot just put a clock on it. Uh, political actors normally in COIN are referee. They are briefed on every decision. However, uh, the rules and responsibilities are laid on the theater commander per se. So there's only one man up on the top, the theater commander who has the show. Rule of law and predefined ROE, ROEs are, are uh, significant to the engagement. However, then ISAF operated on three clear, hold, and build. So for the for the non-military uh, audience, uh, uh, when it is imperative for the coalition partners to understand how to clear, how to hold, how to build, again we were unsure as to ISAF in its uh, in, in in its segment were able to uh, figure that out themselves. Uh, when a consensus is made as to what uh, to clear and coalition partners are in on it. Uh, a reconnaissance uh, is conducted to identify the key leaders, infrastructure, a centralized government institution, which were absolutely missing uh, right uh, through the uh, th throughout the campaign. Uh, military operations may commence uh, to secure the regions and eliminate any of their influence, uh, which is again, uh, which we found were missing. Uh, in the whole phase, coalition partners' objective is basically to hold the region. Uh, we in the Indian Army call it uh, a winning hearts and minds strategy, uh, which is again we found missing. Coalition partners with work with, with regional and uh, uh, local leaders and to open a dialogue with rural leaders, tribal heads, which is again uh, we were very we, we, uh, reluctant to, to, uh, to see uh, and identify whether they were there. Uh, now, uh, building security was a must, but again it was, uh, it was unclear as to how ISAF will do it. Uh, the apprehensions were relayed to the decision makers here in India, and I'm pretty sure the, in the in the uh, Southeast Asian region. Uh, in this scenario, well, the coalition partners uh, were simply uh, advisors to the host and regional actors and provide training. So now from a clear build uh, to clear hold, it was a clear uh, hold and build, uh, which is again a transition which was very swift for the ISAF, in, in, in my opinion, uh, that we jumped. Uh, law is uphold, but uh, again, uh, when swift exchange of uh, hands of the region, uh, uh, streamlining to law, uh, particularly to a region, is again something that uh, was uh, a more of a jumping to conclusion scenario. Uh, the benefits in this scenario are reaped in the form of employment opportunities, which were there. Uh, uh, Rules-based institutions were built. Government offices had had uh, you know open-ended opportunities. Uh, but again, as a part of a larger winning heart and mind strategy, uh, we all know how it ended up. So uh, to, to, to us, uh, the ICF tactical and strategic decisions in Afghanistan had an unclear mandate, unclear role of regional allies, uh, simply cultural awareness and inadequate knowledge for local customs, uh, ineffective ICF influence operations, civilians were again a collateral, village stability operations, uh, which we extensively analyzed. Uh, as a as a principal tactics was was uh, had more loops and had had uh, more disastrous consequences. Now uh, again, I can go on. Uh, the International Security Assistance Force, which was although an authorized force established in two thousand one, uh, jumped uh, to from a security established mechanism to a resolute support mission uh, till when the Taliban continued to enjoy strong support in the hinterlands, and still it was functionally and you know it was operationally active. Um, again, uh, political interference was the cause of death as corruption and a tribal rivalry with something which uh, in India was not relayed pretty well uh, by the ISAF uh, effective mechanisms, uh, resulting in the eventual fall uh, of uh, the concept of Republic of Afghanistan and COIN has no time timeline again, uh, only a republic does. Uh, again, uh, ISAF had regional allies, which uh, uh, you can see on the screen. Uh, which again was not relayed effectively 
to to the ground reality there was a hardly just there was a extensive disconnect so cultural awareness uh, 40 and 50% of the taliban fighters were local and again individual pride uh, protected to one's tribe and exact revenge of the death of relatives uh, in terms of collateral uh, resulted in extensive taliban influence as well as taliban recruitment so this is a basic uh, interpretation of the languages of afghanistan uh, on your screens uh, you've got ineffective strategic objectives that were relayed to lower echelons the top commanders made decisions uh, which were relayed on on documentation uh, written and analyzed by an analyst sitting in the office and those documents did not have a real communique with the lower echelons particularly section platoon and company commanders uh, battalion intel and hq intel segments relayed documents uh, that were analyzed predated uh, perhaps weeks would have passed uh, those those uh, documents would have still there and uh, relayed and analyzed uh, which which uh, had insignificant value uh, ineffective isaf influence ops again propaganda was built on the corruption uh, on, on on significant corruption i would call it by the afghan local police the alp the afghan national police which uh, in our opinion had more significant influence in the region as compared to the ana or the ansf and uh, the historical narratives again to to fight uh, the the significance of uh, defeating uh, the previous invaders british soviets and americans uh, it was again um, uh, exploited extensively to their uh, advantage now the ethnic breakdown of afghanistan is in this 42% of them were pashtun a significant amount of uh, uh, presence on both the sides so you've got ana ansf who are pashtun uh, had their tribal leadership heritage uh, with significant linkages to those who are fighting on the other side other side of the of the fence the taliban the tehreek taliban which again had a significant tajik and hazara and uzbek presence so uh, again uh, coin ops were uh, ex- uh, you know it had involved exhaustive intelligence analysis but it was only possible at the brigade headquarters level lower echelons may have submitted critical intel but they 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 could not uh, uh, be deciphered timely uh, putting an intelligence analyst closer to insurgent groups could have been one of the way uh, the isaf Uh, could have changed into their strategy uh, however once relocated uh, clandestine assets uh, could easily embed combat platoon size units to convey uh, the intelligence collection right to the brigade as well as to the uh, theater commanders uh, civilians mm, were a collateral um, and uh, uh, the isaf did not focus on the enemy centric intelligence and were vulnerable to manipulation and pictured as one of the drivers of conflict uh, increasing civilian losses were again uh approved to to use towards the taliban propaganda they used it extensively in kunar herat kandahar they used it extensively in kunduz uh particularly in kunduz uh so inadequate collection and analysis of data they so isaf did not had a reliable collection of of uh, data as to how many civilian casualties uh, were recorded due to uh, uh predator strikes which attained at a no point of return as it alienated uh, significant local masses and they joined most of them uh, joined taliban uh, for revenge and justice so i am just uh, giving you a brief of the population density uh, you can i just want you to memorize where the uh, most of the red segments are and if you can see a comparative analysis of the red segments in august 13 when the fighting was at peak uh the taliban were able to capture its provincial capitals much quickly much swiftly uh, which is again a resultant of a significant uh, youth uh, presence in this region so uh the uh, one of the reason that i opted up this particular slide is uh, jammu kashmir is also one of the regions where uh, uh, during this time where the fighting was at its peak uh, we found uh, local urban youths uh, coming in up Uh, uh benefiting from the propaganda by taliban uh, citing slogans uh, putting up on social media platforms so this was the urge uh, of of the taliban to to let radicalized youth in kashmir come out and openly support uh, taliban's initiatives um village uh, stability operations was one of the great initiatives that we we thought that the isaf uh, had the opportunity towards uh, uh, to uh, to change the hand uh, to their side but again the afghan national police and the afghan national and provincial police i think at the strategic level the planning was uh, was quite uh, uh, you know uh, feeble and uh, this resulted in 
uh, extensive uh, alienation of uh, 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 folks uh, whose family members died in uh, uh, predator strikes joining Taliban fighters. So now this is a picture that I present to you and I'm uh, most of you have served there. Uh, I could not identify who's who, uh, who's, who's uh, uh, you know, uh, Northern resistance fighters and who's Taliban. And so to my, to conclude, uh, tribal ethnic diversities were a significant part that was played. Uh, ISAF failed to counter strong resentment. Uh, again, as an institution that was tasked to promote and provide security, uh, this could this was a was a disaster. Uh, the ISAF was seen as outsiders because we too, uh, although uh, have extensive experience of counterinsurgency in Jammu Kashmir and and Northeast, we too and that particular region are seen as outsiders, albeit being done in 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 the uh, uh, in in our vicinity only. So this mindset continues to 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 persist in equine operations. Uh, unable to control civilian masses, ISF uh, was viewed as a Western puppet. Uh, justice could not be delivered in time. And blood for blood sentiment uh, was the basic creed. And many family members of victims did join Taliban to settle scores. Uh, well, this is a very prominent image that most of you have seen. And I rest my case here by simply concluding the fact that when... Uh, uh, when the fighting was intense and uh, when uh, Kabul uh, fell uh, in the knees uh, of, of uh, to the knees of Taliban, uh, uh, folks in Jammu and Kashmir, radical hardened troops uh, uh, who who uh, were uh, radicalized from across the border, uh, they came out, they celebrated. Uh, again, when there was an Indo-Pakistan match uh, of of cricket T20. Uh, uh, when India uh, unfortunately lost the match, uh, you've, we've got folks coming in from university schools, uh, uh, dentist schools and hospitals. Uh, they came in and celebrated the victory of Pakistan. So this was, this was a direct implication of what we saw, which was happening across the border. Thanks, Mr. Misa, for your presentation. Now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anders Gunasekhar Rockwell for his remarks. Doc, over to you. Uh, thanks, Indu. You know, like I do in most of these things, I'm not going to get get into a full presentation of my own. I'm, a, a lot of very fascinating and, and different perspectives have been provided today. Uh, just a few things that I, I kind of jotted down while I while I was watching some of these. You know, one of the things I would like to see uh, some scholars tackle, and perhaps some of the folks on the panel here would would take this up, is uh, maybe a comparison with the Sri Lankan LTTE and the narco-terrorism that's being conducted uh, by the Taliban and other organizations in Afghanistan. Uh, LTTE was kind of ahead of its time, I guess, in, in, in this sort of uh, you know, organization and, and running the, the smuggling operations and the drug operations and whatnot uh, to fuel their um, insurgency against the, the Sri Lankan government. And I see a lot of parallels with what's going on in Afghanistan. And, and obviously, you know, it's being done on steroids in Afghanistan. Uh, metaphorically, not literally. Uh, but uh, I would like to see kind of a, 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 compars, a comparison study there. Um, so I appreciate uh, Mr. Mishra's uh, bringing up the, the Naxalites and the fact that, you know, I, I've said for years that the Bush, one of the Bush administration's biggest mistakes that it made, and it made quite a few, uh, was, was picking Pakistan as our, our key ally on the, in the war on terror uh, when we had India, you know, that had, you know, X number of decades of, of experience, both fighting uh, Islamic terrorists and also uh, communist terrorists. And, you know, who are we facing today, right, in, in the region? Uh, Mr. Frath brought it up, you know, if this isn't great power competition, what is, right? And, and India had that experience that we needed. We could have started the quad, you know, three or four years earlier, uh, built around this uh, topic rather than built around the, the response to the Sri Lankan or the, the Indian Ocean uh, tsunami. Uh, and, and yet here we are, you know, quad 2.0, and we still haven't institutionalized, and we need to if we're going to tackle the problems that we've been addressing today. And I think one of the things that this brings up is then that seam that, that exists between uh, U.S. Central Command and U.S. Indo-PACOM. Uh, you know, you can't talk about Afghanistan strictly in a Central Asian uh, environment, right? It's part of it and has been since, you know, back in the Mahabharata and and other early Sanskrit texts, it has been part of South Asia. And what happens in, in uh, 
Afghanistan is going to have just as much impact on South Asia as it's going to have on Central Asia. And that, that I think the, the, the seam there between the two combatant commands creates a, a, a convenience for our adversaries to, to operate in ways that if we had one command that was kind of over the entire uh, operation uh, might not be there. So it might be time for us to go back now that we're not in Afghanistan and, and reimagine what that should be. You know, are we going to talk about Indo-Pacific as a, as a real Indo-Pacific, where we're talking about the Western part of it as well as the Eastern part? Or are we going to continue to think of the Indo-Pacific as ending at the Western shores of, of India, which to me seems rather moronic, um, to be blunt. Um, but, you know, something has to be done because there, there is a scene there that I think is being exploited. Uh, and then to the, the, the talk about uh, counter counterterrorism and uh, all of that, and the I, the role that the ISI and other uh, Pakistani institutions have played in you know providing succor to and and basically being the the creating uh, mind behind the the Taliban in the first place. And you know, here we are, you know, 20, 30 years later, and we still in Washington don't seem to have wrapped our noodle around the idea that you know, these guys didn't just emerge out of nowhere, right? And, and they aren't just in Afghanistan. So one of my questions, I guess, that I'll, that, that I'll leave off with then uh, for the panel as a whole is, okay, so Pakistan now owns the Taliban openly. You know, we, they, they created them, they gave sucker to them, and now they're openly saying that, you know, we've been their stewards for, you know, X number of years while we were supposed to be U.S. allies. Okay, well, it's nice to know the parentage and everything, and it's nice to know that they, they've accepted their ugly stepchild now. But is, has that monster grown beyond Pakistan's ability to, to control it? So my, my question is, will that chicken come home to roost in, in a way that, that Islamabad doesn't want to see it come home to roost? Uh, you know, will it, you know, through the, the Turiki uh, uh, Taliban uh, come back and, and wreak the same kind of damage on Pakistan that it's currently wreaking on uh, Afghanistan. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. And uh, there, I, I know we've got a ton of other questions that we want to bring up too, but we'll just kick off the, the Q&A maybe with that topic. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. So now it's the time for the question. Uh, and uh, my first question is uh, uh, for like, that's for the panel, mm, uh, Al-Qaeda to ISIS-K. Is there any fundamental change in these organizations, targets and techniques? Do you think that the resurgence of Taliban has boosted the morale of terrorist organization and extremist groups around the world? Um, I would like to um, miss uh, Dr. Cruiser, please. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a complex question. I think getting back to some of the broader uh, comments though from the panel, uh, that came after me. I think I'd like to expand on that first to answer this question. Um, we saw some divergence of opinions on what's coming next. And in part, this gets back to my initial point about the lack of information on the ground. That's going to be a perennial problem for at least the next five years or so, at least, that we really don't have solid footing on who is who right now and what's the relationship between the Baragdar and Haqqani Taliban, their relationship to Tariqi Taliban and ISIS-K and how this relates to Pakistan and China's interests because all these guys, their interests were aligned for a while being anti-US, but they are now gonna quickly see themselves as uh, fighting over the spoils and potentially as was uh, said by Dr. Rockwell, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. So everyone had agendas and everyone had plans and that could all blow up in their faces. So. I think that there are uh, profound cleavages between ISIS-K and Al-Qaeda. I think those are also profound differences between what the Taliban was in 2001 versus what they were in 2011 versus what the different factions of the Taliban are today. I mean, just as we have big nuanced differences that we need to appreciate and not oversimplify who ISIS-K is, we can't oversimplify the Taliban as we always have either. They are a collection of group and factions that some is tribal, some is religious, some is ideological, and these parties are going to change hands a lot. When I was on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, Hig in the span of a year changed sides two or three times. This is just the way some of these groups go, and these coalitions are going to shift. And so I think 
uh, we can expect tactics to change. And I think, like I said, earlier, like I implied earlier, the part of the calculus the United States has made is we spent 20 years of really a bungled counterinsurgency operation uh, trying to do uh, expeditionary counterinsurgency, which I don't believe has ever had a successful case, especially with an organization with safe havens. And so after 20 years of bungling that, we decided as much as it's gonna suck for the people of Afghanistan, we need to pull back and then let this situation kind of play out a little bit, let some of these factions break apart. And then, yeah, maybe, I, I don't think we are discounting great power competition. I just think that the decision has been made at some level, let China play in Afghanistan for a little bit. If they think they have a strategy that's gonna win, okay, good luck, let's see if you can do it. Meanwhile, we'll stand back, we'll reorganize elsewhere while you deal with these problems. And then when your chickens come up to roost, then we'll come and we'll re-engage at that point. So, but like I say, it's very complex and I I don't think anyone has all the answers, but I think that's at least a starting point. Thanks, Dr. Cruiser. Mr. Fruit, what's your opinion? Uh, specifically on what, Indu? You're muted. Right. Al-Qaeda to ISK, is there any fundamental difference in their targets, techniques, or uh, are the same? You know, with Al-Qaeda, you have some manner of centralized leadership that has gone back for some time. You know, these are professionals, um, you know, and they've been hosted up in other places. I think they're going to have full safe haven uh, in, in Afghanistan. And we have to remember whether we're talking about uh, ISIS as a whole, ISIS core, directorate of remote provinces, uh, Khorasan, wherever we're talking, when we talk ISIS, we're still talking an organization that has external operations or ex-ops uh, attack ambitions. And that means that they have uh, the ambition to attack outside of the territory that they occupy, such as the West, like the United States or Australia. Al-Qaeda does as well, and we can never uh, forget that. And we can never forget, at the end of the day, when we talk about ISIS-K, I, I mean, I, I agree with what Michael just said. Look, there's components of, and other speakers, I agree with what Andrew said. There's components of ISIS that are going to attack the Shiite Hazars. They're going to attack the Shiites in, in Herat. They're going to attack the um, uh, elements of the Taliban. But there are also components of ISIS-K that aren't. And when you deal with ISIS-K, you're dealing with a lot of ethnic Afghans. Some are Pashtuns, some are Tajik, some are Uzbek, some are whatever. But there isn't just one ISIS-K, and they lost. They lost. They lost the war. The Taliban won. So part of that uh, element of ISIS-K is going to resort to asymmetric warfare. There's going to be uh, groups. There's going to be pockets that are going to fight uh, the Taliban. And then there's going to be pockets that are not, that are going to turn their turban. So the whole point of what I was talking about is that there is no one uh, approach. We, we have to remember that this country has been in, you know, fighting for 1,500 years for a reason. People don't get along. They don't agree in Afghanistan. And you're going to have sects of, of ISIS-K that are going to do certain things, and sects of ISIS-K that are going to do other things. And it's going to be based on religion, ideology, personalities that are very powerful, business relationships. But one thing I want to remind everybody, we always forget how important money is in Afghanistan. So when we talk about threat finance, a lot of people don't really know what counter threat finance is. They think that it has to do with like spreadsheets and accounting. It doesn't. Counter threat finance is the ability to do two things operationally, to prevent uh, an enemy force from generating revenue and to prevent them from operationalizing the revenue to sustain their organization. So for example, uh, it could be a kinetic thing. People could be dying in counter threat finance operations if it's to deter them from generating revenue like ISIS did through oil convoys or if it's narcotics or if it's weapons proliferation or human trafficking or what have you. So preventing that revenue generation at the source event and preventing their, their money laundering uh, and terror finance elements of sustaining those operations are, are critical. I think that both of these organizations have XOPS ambitions. I think there's a lot more gray area than people realize, a lot of analysts realize. And I wanna focus on that term gray zone warfare. When we talk about uh, a non, and some of the other speakers here, brilliant talking about coin, counterinsurgency, versus GPC, great power competition. Do you know what these two things have in common? They both could precede what we call LSCO or large scale combat operations. <coughs> Excuse. 
the environment we have now is one where these various terror groups are working with near peer state adversaries, such as China, such as Pakistan, such as Russia, such as Iran. So we can't forget uh, looking at an environment like Libya, for example, comes to mind. Look at all the, all the different nation states that are involved supporting one organization or another uh, in, in Libya. I think we're dealing with the same environment now when we look at Afghanistan, where we have to consider that these groups may be in bed with different nation states. Um, and I'll pause there for your thoughts. Much appreciated. Mr. Andrew, would you like to add in this? Sure, I think um, part, of, part of the question I believe was, was about, was this seen as a, as a victory for the Al Qaeda movement? And of course it was. I mean, we saw uh, online and offline celebrations of the, 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 a, a long-term strategy that the group won, uh, and they did. And this was seen also as a blow to the Islamic State movement. Online, we saw a lot of, um, you know, in official and unofficial channels, uh, fighters of the Islamic State basically lamenting that, um, you know, things had played out the way they had, but that the group would, their local group ISIS-K would eventually come to you know take advantage of the situation and so I think there are a few unknowns on like my other panelists have mentioned that we just don't have good visibility on a few things and one of those is movement of fighters from other conflict zones um did this arouse a a, a large-scale movement of foreign terrorist fighters in theater um and so I think we'll probably see some element of that play out over the next few months but right now visibility isn't that great and then the second part of that I think at least between Al Qaeda and ISIS K is the longevity, the longevity of the Al Qaeda narrative, right? Taliban takeover, massive victory, right? Immediately an ISIS K attack, and immediately a flip to the Taliban have betrayed uh, the jihadist movement. The Taliban are puppets of different Western regimes. The Taliban are failing at governing, and so you know the longevity of of Al Qaeda's investment in this organization, um, I think is also an unknown. Um, how long is that victory going to really hold in Afghanistan? I think over these winter months, it's probably gonna slip a little bit uh, to say the least. And so, I, and the last thing I'll say, which is an element of like charisma um, that I think Al Qaeda leadership today just lacks that the Islamic State um, does not fail to, to exploit um, in their messaging, in their, in their propaganda. You know, Zawahiri in 40 minute statements isn't the most inspiring individual to listen to, but um, uh, the Islamic State, on the other hand, just released a 20 minute video that very, the way that they composed and craft their narratives is very strategic and very effective and tracing the lineage of ISIS-K to bin Laden and kind of out competing the Taliban for the legitimacy of the jihadist movement. And so I think we might see that, you know, play out well for ISIS-K over the coming months too, as the Taliban start to kind of struggle and come to grips with governing and the large scale crises that they're managing right now. Thanks, Andrew. At this point, we don't have Professor Clark with us uh, due to some uh, other engagement. So Mr. Mishra, would you like to add something here? Uh, certainly, and thank you. I'll be I'll be a bit brief. I know uh, I was uh, uh, rushing. Uh, so uh, the thing is, uh, Taliban has a fascination uh, when we look at the outer end. Uh, you you have uh, uh, Ibrahim Sadar. So, uh, there's an online chatter which says, who do you pick for? Is Ibrahim Sadar good? So then there's a chatter, Mullah Zakir. Is Ibrahim Sadar versus Mullah Zakir? So you've got people, you've got fascinated people coming in um, with, with such such ideology towards Taliban. But then ISISK, uh, you've got another segment coming in which says, no, uh, Taliban has more uh, uh, governance capability than the ISISK. Then uh, uh, supporters uh, on the online chat uh, uh, dismiss the comments made by by uh, Taliban supporters and say uh, ISISK has more uh, Khurasa, uh, the the idea of Khurasa province uh, still lays uh, in the hands of, of ISISK and it is the legitimate uh, player in the region. But then uh, fascinated by the 1500s as as my uh, uh, mate here uh, talked about its its uh, you know historic victory. Fascinated by the victorious uh, component, um, uh, most of the followers of, of Taliban on the online charter here, particularly in India, uh, they talk about uh, the, the, you know, uh, more better governance, uh, better security, better stability. ISIS Khorasan is not. So in the eyes of those who are following, ISIS Khorasan is a lone radical group, which is a mercenary form of a way which has a limited agenda, is not very clear how uh, 
uh, how to bring stability in the region is not very clear how to bring governance in the region on the other hand taliban has more uh, experience uh, taliban has been experienced the taliban 2.0 is better in governance in the eyes of those who are following it as compared to taliban 1.0 definitely yes again a chatter has come up which has been rebutted by the those followers isi of of isis uh, khorasa so this is this is a new trend that has come up online again it is hard to say how the modus operandi varies because isis khorasa has not come up with an agenda or the idea how to build up in better governance uh, what is their role what is the role play if they come into power how uh, what is the negotiation uh, what are the players what are the active key members taliban has uh, more uh, uh, clear vision in terms of khorasan has more activity has more active players now to add this i i spoke about the two uh, uh, you know one was the foreign uh, former uh, deputy uh, uh, internal security minister he has more uh, operational perspective in kunduz and herat so you've got taliban giving its priority to its own leaders to operate uh, independently so this is again uh, not a taliban kind of a way which is seen as khorasan to be non uh, non to be unconventional not traditional so again this has been rebutted by the taliban saying uh, they believe in the idea of of uh, uh, governance le leading it to one principle so you've you've got uh, uh, this vivid uh, uh, information uh, and uh, references coming in from different people who do you choose are uh, you muted yeah my next question is to dr, uh, to dr. cruiser just uh, i want the military perspective or a bit uh, the government per us government perspective on this question uh, when united states is not able to define its strategy towards uh, taliban or towards afghanistan is the taliban is a terrorist organization or not so like what is the potential strategy to deal uh, with the taliban is there any possibility to align the taliban towards counter terrorism operations uh, not partnering partnering with taliban but in any way yeah certainly not partnering certainly not allying and certainly not anything at the formal government level is it conceivable at very limited tactical levels that we could see some uh common forces engaged not certainly not uniform personnel and certainly not even direct uh, operatives of the united states government but i could see organizations allied with the united states inside of afghanistan being able to forge limited partnerships with parts of the taliban at the tactical level this would be very complicated it would require a lot of uh, track to uh, diplomacy going on and i'm not sure right now who the intermediaries would be that would do this but like i said especially as over the next couple of years we see increasing divides we see calls for action i mean people forget that in late 2001 early 2002 we had cooperation with the Iranian government and the US alliance, uh, the ISAF alliance in Afghanistan just because our interests allied over the Hazara and over Herat province and over a number of things that went on there. So it's possible, it would be very limited, would be very low key, not direct and certainly nothing formal. And I would imagine anything that was going on would be de denied at higher levels. But it's going to be all about where those interests lie and what short term agreements can be reached and between which groups. My next question, Mr. Frog, what are the challenges for counter terrorism strategy when it comes to uh, protection of human rights? What is the counter terrorism strategy for protection of human rights? Yes. I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I, I don't know. I think. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of shift to Syria for a minute. When we look at all these refugee camps, they were a hotbed for insurgency. When we, let's just back up even more outside of just insurgency. Let's just look at unrest globally. When you have refugee movements and you have extreme poverty and extreme, uh, extremely difficult human rights uh, uh, atmospherics, 
young men around the world tend to get into trouble. It could be here in the United States, they're in the inner city and they don't have a lot of opportunity and they join a criminal gang. Could be in Mexico or Colombia and they join a drug cartel, or it could be in the Middle East and Africa and they join a, a terrorist organization or a militant organization. We tend to see with great uh, socioeconomic challenges and, and instability, uh, environment that emerges where young men get into trouble and they band together with whatever that is. In the United States, you know, we, we join the Army, we join the Air Force, you know, we join the police force uh, because we have some semblance of governance. But when you have a, a, an environment where you don't, uh, young men will, will band together uh, with whomever they can. And oftentimes uh, there are organizations that are doing bad things. So I would just say uh, instability breeds insurgency. Thank you. And my next question is uh, also is connected uh, with the, the last previous question. Um, I'm hoping to answer from you first that how the counterterrorism strategy can be best used uh, in the de-radicalization process. So, you know, I mean, this might be a better question for Anant than me, but look, at the end of the day, uh, we talk about hearts and minds and, 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 and whatnot. It, it's not just engagement with people on an individual level and tribal elders level, imams. It's, it's also engagement in the information environment. I think one of the things that we did not do as well as we could, I mean, the, the title of this session is Lessons Learned. One of the things that we allowed to happen we allowed the Taliban, we allowed Pakistan, we allowed China to dominate the information environment. We never really ironed out the way to not control, but to counter the disinformation that the Taliban was putting out in the information environment. I mean, Anant talked about uh, you know, civilian casualties and how risk adverse the United States was. And we were, we, we did ever, and Michael talked about it, we did everything that we could to not uh, kill innocent civilians. But the nature of kinetic airstrikes when, you know, we, we have those types of capabilities is that there's sometimes civilian casualties, but we did everything we could to mitigate that for 20 years. And I would argue that uh, every time we did an effective operation, uh, I'm, Michael, you know, feel free to hop in here at any time. Anytime we did an effective operation where we had a kinetic airstrike that did take out a high value individual that was an insurgent, the Taliban would counter it in the information environment by saying we killed a bunch of women and children. And it was, it wasn't true. And we never really aggressively um, uh, pursued control of the information environment. So I think when you start talking hearts and minds, we look at disinformation, misinformation, information suppression all over the world. Right now, here in the United States, for our friends uh, and allies in India, we're having a lot of division and internal conflict here amongst our own people because of media outlets and social media and Silicon Valley uh, uh, companies that are promoting uh, division and, and, and conflict amongst our civilian population. I think the United States really needs to get better just in general at engaging people in a modern technology, social media and information environment. And I would really like to see Michael and Anant's uh, uh, feedback on that specifically. Yeah, let me jump on that really quickly because I actually just lectured for ACSC on information environment as part of DIME on this very issue. So, and getting to Afghanistan specifically, there's a, there's a couple of things to bear in mind about this. And also gets back to your point earlier about money and how we don't take that into account too. Because a lot of this has got to come together in a quick anecdote I will give. But uh, this is a big problem for the United States government as a whole, at least short term. I'm a big proponent that longer term, our information environment and our decentralized information environment is a benefit in terms of the longer term great power competition. In terms of these tactical battles though, it's an, an operational battles, at, especially at the level of a conflict like Afghanistan, it's a problem because yes, a lie will make it around the world before a truth uh, gets going in the morning. And the simple fact is that the United States is not going to knowingly tell something that is untruthful or jump out there to put out a narrative that might later be proven to be false because our credibility is based on our open press and our inability to assert control over the media, which is a limitation that a lot of our rivals don't have. Long-term, I think that gives us credibility and as a benefit, but as you say, short-term, it's a problem. And so when it comes to a strike and reports of civilian casualties, the Taliban can just jump on the media and say, yeah, 50 innocent civilians were killed when you bombed this hospital. 
we're not going to jump out right away and say no, because first thing we're going to do is say, wait a second, did we do something wrong? What is the ground truth before we can engage this? Because if we do come out and say no, and then it turns out it's yes, then we've uh, not just had the problem, but then we look like we we're lying and then a lot of our other issues are discredited. So, and this gets back to, again, the whole human issue and how we do strikes in the future. Now, but back to the bigger problem though, this gets back to really the failure again for a lessons learned perspective of 20 years in Afghanistan. So when I was in Kapisa province, uh, running the PRT, our biggest adversary was our provincial governor, who our mission was to empower and to tie to the Afghan people. The problem was that he was a HIG operative who had basically bought his position from Karzai and was funneling money uh, to contractors that were paid for out of the U.S. dime. And those contracts, uh, in part, he would withhold money as a kickback for himself. That's how he made his money that he bought his governorship in the first place. So he's got to make that money back on the one hand. And two, he's in the Tajik north half of the province, and he's keeping the insurgency going in the Pashtun south half of the province by basically paying Hig and Taliban to bomb our developments that he has just helped issue the contract on. Everyone in that province knows that this is exactly what's going on. And the minute we start to try to intervene or we start to push the issue, then he redirects his uh, fire towards our forces. He ended up uh, killing, I say assassinating, murdering one of the PRT commanders. He happened to be the Pancher PRT commander in 2009, you can look that up. But we basically established that this was a mafia style hit against the PRT commander who was unwilling to engage in the corrupt operations anymore. And we pushed a, a, a counter um, corruption uh, task force uh, citation up through, it went up to General Petraeus to Hamid Karzai at that level. And this was gonna be the first big case of the anti-corruption task force that the US was pushing in 2000 and 2011. The end result was uh, the governor was basically promoted out of the office and the counter uh, corruption task force was disbanded and the attorney general of Afghanistan was fired. And so this was the dilemma that we always had in our ideas of how we were gonna fund counterinsurgency versus how Afghan politics was really working, how it's being exploited. And that all fed back into this Taliban narrative of how ineffective we are, how bad and corrupt the Afghan government was and how turning to the Taliban style of government would be the better way to go. And this was a cycle that was perpetuated over 20 years that we never got our heads wrapped around. Uh, well, if I may, uh, Michael, you've, you've put it very well. And uh, as, a, as a man on the ground, troops in contact would have been uh, one of the messier issues that you as an Air Force personnel could have faced. Now, interesting to the audience, I'll put you this. Pakistan has 18 news outlets that is dedicated to show the negative propaganda of what the Indian government does and convert it into their initiative, what they do in in uh, uh, in, in in the uh, occupied uh, Kashmir and relay it back uh, to the to, to Kashmiri audience, which we do not know of. So, 18 dedicated TV channels to influence the minds of the people in Jammu and Kashmir. Again, illegally satellite and uh, uh, you know relayed it to the audience at home, giving them only one opportunity to not look at the state channel that we have in India, on, authorized by the government of India, but to give them an option to take the ulterior motives and relay it in some way that what the Indian government does not wish to show. So uh, Akhundazad comes out uh, to, to one uh, TV channel and says, we will stay numb about Jammu and Kashmir and we will not go beyond that domain. And on the minute he speaks about 2000 plus uh, you know, tweets have come up which says Jammu Kashmir is a part or there is a greater part of uh, uh, Khurasan and it's it's uh, the fight begins at home so he's got radicalized components coming in from uh, taken take to uh, you know taken up by ISIS Khurasan and Taliban in some information influence operations way to influence the minds and and as well minds of the people not the hearts I'm pretty sure of minds of the people uh, to to relay an information as uh, what the government of India does and what what the Taliban wants. So this is an incitation that we saw. Now, another thing is 
uh, when uh, the local troops, um, the, the Jammu Kashmir police, uh, the uh, paramilitary forces engaged into a counter operations, uh, we too faced a, some collaterals. And uh, you know how it is when it is fire engagement, uh, normally you, you, it's difficult to, to contain uh, the free flow of, of uh, uh, civilians. So there were a few collateral. And 10 minutes later, the, the, the exact incident was narrated in an alternate perspective, tweeted by the IS, uh, DG ISPR, the state uh, uh, of the, the inter-services uh, uh, public relations team. Uh, 10 minutes later, tweeted by the deputy prime minister. Uh, 10 minutes later, tweeted by the foreign minister. And uh, 20 minutes later, tweeted by the prime minister of Pakistan. So I cannot believe my prime minister tweeting an incident and it will take him 10 minutes, 20 minutes roughly to perhaps make a tweet. I mean, it will take me days for to influence the prime minister's office to tweet. So how quickly their influence or influence operations are effective. Uh, this is a, this is a principal example of what you can see for the case of Jammu and Kashmir. Thanks, I appreciated this, Mr. Vishal. And now I would like to have the, Mr. Andrew, your opinion on the de-radicalization process with the counter-terrorism strategy. I didn't talk about demobilization before we talk about uh, de-radicalization problems, but um, I, I, I will just add to the previous panelists' comments is just that an insurgency at a top level does two things. Uh, it implements a system of control and a competitive system of meeting. And we've just lost that battle for the last 20 years if you can't uh, come to, up to bat on a competitive system of meeting. And that was one of the biggest findaways that we had from, uh, we did a podcast um, in, on Mosul, uh, the, the civilian journalist and historian Omar Mohammed, who lived under ISIS's uh, brutal rule in his native city of Mosul. He oftentimes reflected on that podcast that there were multiple points for the US coalition to invest in civilian grassroots democracy efforts. The content was all there. Uh, the, the, the effort from the people was all there. They believed in what they were doing and they came to the table. But if you don't invest in that on the other side and if you focus on a Baghdad or a Kabul centric strategy and you're not in local offices and you lose local battles, like we lost the Mosul, um, you're going to lose that competitive system of meaning over time. So. That's, um, I, I know we're running up in time, so I'll just cut my remarks short there. Thank you, I appreciate it much. At this point, I will wrap up the things uh, and uh, I would like to offer thank you to our operation team who helped us in making this event happen. And thank you for all attendees joining us today. I, will, I would like to thank to our speakers for their times, uh, Dr. Cruza, Mr. Joshua Froth, and uh, Professor Clark, Mr. Andrew Mines, and Mr. Mishra, thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned for our next book talk event on December 8. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.